India, 1974. West Bengal. Autumn. The autumn of 74. The autumn of hunger. In the east and in the west, in the north and in the south, rang the cries of hunger. The cries of hunger brought back the dire memories of 1943, the Great Bengal Famine. It was a famine which our British masters refused to admit officially. Famine had come again and again in the colonial past, the result of the imperialist plunder of town and country. The hundred years of the 19th century brought 27 official admissions of famine. And famine took the lives of 26 millions of our people. It had been the result of systematic exploitation and planned plunder. And the principal instrument of that plunder had been our own feudal landlords, rolling in the imperialist lap of the permanent settlement. The scene has changed very little and our villagers are still haunted by the spectre of starvation. Two centuries of colonial theft denuded our people. Reforms in land and production have been too slow to make themselves felt. Rural poverty remains the demon that refuses to die. The land is blessed with the fruits of our people's toil, but the fruits are merchandise. While the land is singing with green, sun-swept paddy, the earthen pots of the poor echo hollowly. Among the countless gruel kitchens for free food is this one at Kolagachia, only 30 miles from Calcutta. Kolagachia is in the heart of South Bengal, in the heart of the fertile delta of the river Ganges. With their empty bowls, they also came in the west, the district of Bakura, Shaltura, deep in the plateau. 
and amid the harsh rocks, yet another gruel kitchen. Statistics tell us that the people of this area have a per capita income of 26 paisa per day, 8 rupees a month. It was the last day at the Shalpura Gruel Kitchen and they kept coming to the Langar Khana with their empty bowls. The little there was, was given. No one knew what would happen the next day. Independence in 1947 brought an end to the permanent settlement. The old zemindars had gone, but nothing was settled in the new relations in the agricultural economy. All that was brought about was an unholy alliance between the captains of Indian finance and the last householders of the fading aristocracy. The dying grasp of the feudal stranglehold is still upon our rural poor. Surveys of agricultural land in India reveal startling figures. 56% of our land remains in the hands of the top 10%, represented by a combine of big landlords, millers, moneylenders, and food speculators. 40% of our land is scattered among our rural middle class. And the lower 50% of our people have only 4% of the land to share among itself. This lower 50% of our impoverished landholders and the vast hordes of our landless peasantry constitute almost 80% of our rural population. Thus, the means of production remain in the hands of the few and the multitude sink beneath the poverty line. They live constantly on the verge and the chains of heavy indebtedness bind them. Official statements about the character of usurer's capital tell us that a little over half the loans from private moneylenders are sunk into day-to-day -day household expenses. Only a quarter of it is used for growing food. Every month, the grasp of the Shylock grows. Every year, the interest mounts. And the interest ranges from a high 40% to a murderous 200%. They live but one small step away from total destitution. The least crisis, failures of crop or calamities of nature, push them over the brink. What faces them is destruction. The autumn of 74, the autumn of hunger. The autumn of festivals. The festival of the goddess Durga. The festival of the mother goddess. The celebration of prosperity.
at the important marketplace of Kagdeep in South Bengal, the auspicious drums were beating around the gruel kitchen. Under the shadow of the Vishalakhi temple, thousands of hungry people had congregated. They were waiting anxiously for the khichuri, a watery gruel of maize, wheat and lentils. This girl is 16 years old, sweet 16. The autumn of 74, the autumn of protest. Metropolitan Calcutta awoke to the dangerous cries of hunger. Such dangerous cries are to be heard today, not only here, but in all dark corners of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Upon this geography of hunger can be seen the ugly fangs of imperialism. At the World Food Conference at Rome, the United States Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Earl Butz, put it very bluntly. Food, he said, is a weapon. It is now the principal tool in our negotiating kit. The imperialist force makes no bones about blackmail, blackmail on hunger. And the local merchants of hunger, profiteering on starvation, serve the imperialist purpose.
Towards the end of the autumn of 74, life came slowly, startlingly, back in our villages. The green paddy ripened into gold. Late that autumn came the bumper harvest. Officially, the gruel kitchens were no longer necessary. The moment of crisis passes, but the rural poor have nothing to welcome the coming harvest with. The golden corn they have made will move into the granaries of the rich. Government sources have estimated a 100 crore rupees investment in agriculture and food grains by a combine of big landlords, rice millers, hoarders, and other merchants of hunger. On the basis of one rupee per kilogram net profit, this combine has earned 150 crores of liquid, untaxed rupees. Now, a total of 250 crores of rupees is deployed in buying and cornering all sorts of food grains and essential commodities. The autumn of 74 has left thousands of our rural poor in total destitution. They have been living on a verge and the moment of crisis has toppled them over. The exodus began from their homes, from the land to which they belong, because there was nothing to live on. For food and for work, they thronged to the cities. former capital of colonial India, the cultural capital of India. The city of palaces, the home of seven million people. the matrix of technological India, the largest port in eastern India, the hothouse of foreign capital, the bunker of the Indian bourgeoisie, the major marketplace for food. Calcutta awoke to the armies of the night. On pavements and on platforms, on bridges, and even under the city sky, they set up their camps.
the human body needs 2,500 to 4,000 calories a day. According to the United Nations Nutrition Committee, 2,200 calories a day is the danger level. A government survey tells us that 50% of Indian households consume between 940 to 1,950 calories, which is 60% to 20% below the basic need. Only 4% of Indians have enough calories necessary for growth and survival. They came to the city for food and for work, but the city had nothing to offer. They found around them the city's markets overflowing. The haves were living off the fat of the land. of the concrete jungle is that of the survival of the fittest. And the fittest are those who hold the means of production. November 74, the World Food Conference at Rome estimated that at least 460 million people are threatened with starvation throughout the world today. 10 million people will probably die this year, and most of them are under five years old.
Hunger drives people away from the homes that they have built. Life adjusts itself. But in its wake, it leaves a tale of terror, a living tale that no one can forget. With dire memories, the tiller goes back to the plough. The land is turned, the seed is sown. The harvest will come. The golden corn will shimmer in the sunlight. But will the sweat of their brow bring for them their daily bread? Or will the demon steal from them the treasures they have labored for? <laughs>